So, um, we will continue with the molecular biology, the third lecture. We will talk about the human genome. Now, this is just a comparison of the different genomes among uh, several organisms. So, we know that uh, the human genome is composed of about 3 billion base pairs. Okay, and these three billion base pairs are distributed among 46 chromosomes. Now, it was estimated um, a while ago that we had about uh, 100,000 genes when the, when the Human Genome Project first started in uh, 1990. Um, but then th this, this uh, number uh, continued to be reduced uh, the more uh, of the human genome was sequenced. So it became 75,000, 50,000, uh, 30,000, 25,000, as you can see in this number, which is wrong. Uh, the uh, last number of number of genes, the estimated number of number of genes uh, in the human genome is about 20,500 genes, which is similar to the number of estimated genes um, um, in, in, uh, in mice. You can see that the difference between in, in the number of genes between the human genome and uh, the worm genome is really very minimal. Not only that, there's also a lot of variation among different living organisms. So uh, in terms of the size of the genome, so uh, you can see that the size of the genome of bacteria is very small compared to humans. You can see the variation of uh, human of uh, genomes among different organisms, um, and and this is not for you to memorize. Just you know, just um, look at it and and uh, enjoy. Okay, so let's look at the uh, human genome and what it is made of. So we know that the human genome is made of it's composed of three billion base pairs. Okay. 40% of the human genome is related to genes. 60% of the human genome uh, is basically intergenic DNA, meaning that you have DNA sequences between ge uh, gene sequences. Now, if you look at these 40%, only 2% of the human genome codes for proteins. This is really a small portion of the whole human genome. So out of the 3 billion base pairs, only 2% would code for proteins. You know, these the functional molecules of cells. Now, 38% of the human genome uh, would code for non-coding RNA molecules, okay? uh, gene-related sequences, pseudogenes, for example, that is things that look like genes, but they are not true genes. They do not get transcribed. Uh, gene fragments, introns, untranslated regions, etc. Okay, about well, 30% of the human genome is basically made of introns. These all are really rough numbers. They are not the final ones. Now, the reason why I say that is that um, there are is that in in the past few years. Uh, studies have shown that about 70% of the human genome can be transcribed. So it's not only 2% or part of the 38%. So anyhow, so 60% of the human genome is basically composed of intergenic DNA, DNA sequences between uh, gene or gene-related sequences. About 5% of the human genome is basically unique or low copy number. And 55%, this is a huge portion of the human genome, 55% is made of uh, uh, repetitive DNA sequences. These repetitive DNA sequences can either be tandem or they can be interspersed. So what does that mean? Tandem means that it's a sequence that, that is repeated one after the other in the same region. Interspersed means that you have the same sequence, but it's located, these sequences are located far away from each other. Okay? 
So uh, you can have the same sequence, for example, on chromosome 1, chromosome 5, and chromosome, I don't know, 14, okay? Whereas here, you can see the same, the same exact sequence uh, uh, repeated one after the other uh, within the same region. Now, 5% of, uh, uh, of the human genome contains sequences that are non-coding, meaning that they are not transcribed yet they are highly conserved, meaning that you can see the same exact sequence or similar or highly similar sequences in other, uh, in other organisms like, for example, uh, primates, uh, chimpanzees and, uh, and mice and so on. So, so this means that these sequences are really important, but we don't know uh, what their functions are. Now, if you look at these tandem repeats, uh, or, or if you look at the 55%, about 10% of the human genome is made of tandem repeats. And this can be categorized into different types. You have what is known as satellites, you have mini satellites, and you have micro satellites or short tandem repeats. About 45% uh, of the human genome is made of interspersed uh, sequences. Okay, and 42% um, and of the human genome is made of retrotransposons. Retro means that they originate from RNA molecules, and there are three types of such retrotransposons. You have what is known as signs, they make up 11% of the human genome, or short interspersed sequences, or you can have lines, and they make up about uh, 20, 21% uh, of the human genome, long interspersed sequences, or you have retrovirus-like elements and they make up about 8% of the human genome. And 3% of the human genome, uh, basically they look like DNA transposons, that is, uh, they originate from uh, DNA viruses. Okay. So let's start talking about tandem repeats now the different types of tandem so we have satellites okay and satellites satellite sequences or macro satellites of dna they are uh, made of repeated sequences and these sequences are about 5 to 300 base pair sequences and they are repeated uh, millions of times so they make up a large portion of the human genome okay most of these satellite sequences are located in the centromeres. This is the centromere of a chromosome. So they are located right here in the middle of chromosomes and they separate the uh, short arm of the chromosome, that is the P arm, from the Q arm, the long arm of the chromosome. So these are the centromeres and they are really important in, uh, in um, um, meiosis and mitosis in separating chromosomes during cell division, during the cell cycle. Now, you also have macro satellites in telomeric repeats. So what are telomeres? These are located at the ends of chromosomes. So these are made of repeated sequences as well. And here is uh, uh, chromosomes with telomeres labeled. Okay, so you can see they are located at the end of chromosomes. Now, how are they labeled? They are labeled by a technique known as fluorescent in situ hybridization. In situ means in place. Okay, so it's known as fluorescent in situ hybridization or it's known as FISH. Okay, so you will hear about this technique, FISH, uh, when you go to hospitals because it's widely used. Okay. Now, so uh, centromeric and telomeric repeats, uh, as I said, they are repeated millions of times uh, in, in specific regions of chromosomes, like, uh, for example, telomeres, they are made of the, this sequence, T, T, A, G, 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 and it's repeated, again, millions of times. And you have the centromeres right here as well. Okay. Now, mini and micro satellite DNA sequences uh, they are highly repeated, okay, uh, but they differ in size. So, for example, mini satellites 
are also known as variable number tandem repeats VNTRs so you have a sequence that is made of um, uh, let's say about uh, 20 base pair sequences 20 to 100 base pair and this sequence is repeated several times and they are tandemly repeated so they are close to each other one after the other micro satellites are repeats that consist of about uh, 2 to 10 uh, base pairs and they can also be repeated um, uh, several times as you can see in this example right here so mini satellites or VNTRs uh, they are uh, each repeat contains about 20 to 100 base pair uh, sequence and it's, it can be repeated 20 to 50 times on the other hand micro satellites they are repeated 100, uh, 10 to 100 times and they they have this size uh, 2 to 10 base pairs okay so you can have for example since we are deployed or our cells are deployed uh, you can have on a chromosome uh, this repeat right here the ca repeat so ca 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 and it's repeated 16 times on the other chromosome you can have the same exact repeat but it's repeated 14 times instead of um, uh, 16 times so you can have a lot of variation even individual now this is a cause of polymorphism that is different shapes of DNA sequences so you can have uh, for example different sequences of VNTRs and CNT oh, and, and STRs on the uh, on, on homologous chromosomes like uh, I showed you in the previous slide and this has been helpful actually in forensic testing because we can differentiate samples of individuals from each other based on this polymorphism so here's an example right here a few examples so you have individual a you look at strs or v or a certain vntrs on one chromosome you have uh, three repeats on the other chromosome you have one two three four five six seven eight nine ten repeats okay now on the other hand you have individual b on homologous chromosomes the same exact sequence uh, exists on the same location on the same chromosome exactly except that the number of repeats is different so on both chromosomes you have six repeats rather than three or ten so this is individual a uh, you have a this repeat um, uh, is the um, the one that is repeated ten times and this is the one that is repeated three times now in this individual there's only one band if, if we do RFLP or if we uh, do PCR and we'll talk about PCR later on and there's so there's only one band which is the six uh, time repeated VNTR so look at these different individuals looking at a certain VNTR or STR you can see how each individual ha has uh, his or her on molecular pattern and this is what is known as molecular profiling or finger printing now we can use vntrs and strs in uh in 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 uh, uh, paternity testing in forensic medicine in diagnostic medicine as well and this is an example okay so right here in this family okay this is known as a pedigree so what you have in here uh, you have square representing a male a circle representing a female so you have male and female uh, they're married they are connected to each other and they have this little daughter now and you have another family uh, female male so they get married and they have this boy and this boy gets married to this girl right here and they have lots of kids or in other words so they have this female male 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 female male and female okay so if we look at this family uh, and if we look at a certain vntr for example uh, we would notice that there are four different alleles so alleles is basically 
uh, type of a gene or type of a DNA sequence. So they have four alleles. Allele number one is when they have six repeats. Allele number two is having four repeats. Allele number three having three repeats. And allele four is having one repeat only or one of, of such sequence. So by doing RFLP or by doing PCR, we get the following. So um, these patterns represent the person that, that is located on top of them, okay? So here we have the grandfather, okay, of, of the first family. And this grandfather has a lead number one and a lead number two. So he has these two. Now, this <clears throat> grandmother has allele number two and allele number three. So you would expect this daughter to have one of these two from her father and one of these two from her mother. And that's true. In fact, she has allele number one from her father and allele number three from her mother. Look at this family now. Let's look at this grandmother right here. She has alleles two and three. Look at this grandfather. He has alleles one and four. So you would expect this boy to have either one of these two alleles and either one of these two alleles. And that's true. Uh, he got allele number two from his mother and he got allele number four from his father. Okay. Now, Let's look at these uh, individuals right here, these children right here. So um, you would expect you would expect them to have either alleles one and three from the mother, or alleles two and four from the father. And you can see the pattern uh, in in here. Okay. So this is from the mother. This is from the father, and so on. Now. So how can we differentiate these uh, three individuals? How can we differentiate these two individuals in this case? Well, what we do is we look at another allele or we look at another VNTR. So, um, uh, and, or we look at another STR and so on. So in forensic medicine and paternity testing, uh, there it's, it, um, they do not rely on one single VNTR or one single STR. Rather, they look at, at multiple VNTRs and STRs. Okay. Now, so we can use uh, this for paternity testing. Same idea as like I showed you before um, in the previous lecture or in, in this one right here. Uh, you can see the pattern uh, uh, between the, the, the parents versus children. Okay. So now, one major feature of the human genome is variation. And variation is not only in VNTRs and STRs, rather variation can also exist in single nucleotides. And this is known as single nucleotide polymorphism. So this is a major source of polymorphism. So basically the idea is that at a single location on a chromosome or DNA, you have the same exact sequence except that there is a difference in one nucleotide and this is single nucleotide polymorphism okay so um, when is it when is a change considered a polymorphism versus a mutation well it is known this is the the thing if it exists in more than one percent of the general population, if a variation, a gen genetic variation, a SNP as we call it, exists in more than one percent of the po general population, we call it a polymorphism. If it exists in less than one percent of the population, then we consider it a mutation. Okay, so this is the uh, this is an important point that you need to know. Now. So these SNPs are really um, uh, spread throughout the human genome, and there is one SNP for every 300 uh, base pairs. 
So we have a total of about 10 million SNPs in our genome. Okay, 10 million SNPs, that's a lot. But only half a million are important or relevant. So what do we mean by important or relevant? Well, let's see here. So here we have a examples of SNPs. So uh, you have an individual, for example, having this sequence. Uh, this person has at a certain location that is known to be variable among individuals in, 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 in a population. He, this person has G and G on both paternal and maternal uh, alleles. So we said that this person is homozygous for this particular SNP. Okay, now let's look at uh, another sequence, another location, and we would notice uh, that the paternal allele uh, contains an A, the maternal contains a C. Okay, so we say that this person is heterozygous for this particular uh, SNP. Notice that the distribution of, uh, of, of, the, of this SNP among individuals in a population is that A exists in 90% of the population versus C which exists in 10% of the population. So we call this a minor allele. Now these SNPs uh, in, in individuals in, in, in a population the G exists in 51% of a population versus T which exists in 49% of the population uh, and but this individual does not have a T of, obviously. But notice that all of the other sequences are exactly the same except, except at these two positions. Okay, so this is individual uh, one looking at uh, a, a SNP in chromosome two, uh, different individuals, six individuals. Uh, this person has T and C. This individual, same location, same SNP, same position, has C and C. This person has T and T. This person has T and C, so and this person has C and T, and this person has C and T. Okay, so you can see that these SNPs, um, that the mainly they are either T or C. Okay. How are SNPs important? So I said that half a million SNPs are relevant. What do we mean by relevant? Well, these SNPs can be uh, divided into two types. They can either be linked or they can be causative. What we mean by causative is that they cause a phenotype. Okay, so the, they cause a certain phenotype. For example, maybe a phenotype in, um, I don't know, skin color, maybe a phenotype in something that you can see. Maybe sometimes it's a phenotype that exists when a certain condition happens. So, for example, you have two individuals. They look maybe brothers. They look exactly the same, except that when one of them takes uh, a medication for headache, like paracetamol, for example, you see one of them needs just one pill. The other one would need two pills. Okay, we wouldn't be able to know un unless they go through this certain circumstance or certain condition. So this is a variation. Now, um, this variation can be relevant, well, because of their need of different doses of medications. So that's what we mean by it causes a phenotype. So that's a causative SNP. Now, it's not a major thing. It's not a, a, a mutation that causes a disease, rather it just it causes a certain phenotype. So causative SNPs can be located in non-coding uh, non regions, and we call them non-coding SNPs. So they can be located, for example, in the promoter region. They can be located in a regulatory sequence, uh, uh, meaning that a sequence of DNA that regulates, for example, gene expression, protein production. Or SNPs can also be in the coding region. So they exist in the DNA sequence that results in, in uh, that influences protein production or the sequence of amino acids in a protein. So we call it a coding step. This may change the amino acid sequence. 
sometimes this change may not be that important. Okay, so it's not like the protein is defective. The protein, or let, let's say an enzyme, it might be about 50% less efficient than if it has the other SNP. Okay, uh, and we would not be able to know the person is totally normal. Now, or SNPs can be linked, meaning that they are they do not cause a phenotype, rather that they are um, they are linked to a certain phenotype. So we notice, for example, if we look at individuals having a certain disease, let's say, we would notice that a lot of individuals have with, with this disease have T's. Okay, it's either C or a T. And these individuals that are affected with a certain disease or condition, they have a T, okay? Whereas in healthy individuals, uh, very few of them have a T, okay? But most of them have a C. What does that mean? Does that mean that if we change a C, this C to a T, let's say, or if C is mutated to a T, these individuals would be affected? No, not necessarily. Okay, does that mean that if we change T to a C in these individuals that are affected with a, with a disease, does that mean that they would not have the disease? Again, no, not necessarily. True, but what, what, what it means is that there is a high frequency that individuals having a disease would have a T. It's just a probability, okay? So if, if you know that someone has a T, you would say, you know what, there is a probability that you might develop a certain disease. It does not mean that for sure he would develop that disease. So what does it, what does it mean that it's linked? It's linked to a phenotype, yes, or it's linked to a gene. Maybe it's located near a gene that causes that disease. So when the gene is inherited, the SNP is also inherited along with it. Okay, so that's what linked uh, means. And I hope it's clear. Let's uh, talk about interspersed uh, repeats, uh, meaning that it's the same sequence, but they are uh, found in different areas or different regions of the human genome. There are different types. Um, we have it, mainly they're known as transposons and transposons uh, means that they uh, or another name for them is jumping genes. Why do we call them this way? Because these regions of the human genome can jump, they can change location from one region to another. Okay, it does not mean that as I'm talking to you right now, my transposons are jumping. It doesn't mean that these transposons are always jumping. In fact, most of them have lost the ability to change location. But some of them, it seems that some of them do or can change locations. And when, when they change locations, they can cause certain diseases. I'll, we'll talk about it in a second. So there are uh, three classes, not two classes, I'm sorry. There are three types of transposons. We have DNA transposons, uh, and they make up 3% of the human genome, meaning that they originated from DNA viruses. But most of these jumping genes or transposons uh, have originated from uh, retroviruses, okay? And they can be divided into two types. We have uh, long interspersed elements or sequences or short interspersed elements or also known as uh, signs. But most of the uh, most of these retrotransposons are of the long interspersed elements type. And there's a third type known as retrovirus like elements. Uh, nothing much is known about these elements right here sequences. Okay, so as I said, these transposons can change location. So they can jump from one region of the human genome to another. Some of them do, very few actually. And when they do that, they can cause diseases like hemophilia, A and B, like certain cancers, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and so on. So how do they cause diseases? 
disrupting genes. So we can have a transposon somewhere on a different chromosome, and this transposon can change location. So it can jump okay, into a certain region. If it jumps within or inside a gene, it can disrupt it. It can uh, uh, result in the production of a faulty non-functional protein. It can also be located or it can jump into a region that is that does not code for a protein but it regulates the coding of a protein so it, it's not located uh, uh, inside the gene itself rather it's located outside the gene but it's very close to the gene uh, causing a, a change in the expression in the activity of the gene or these transposons can be located or they can jump somewhere else far away from where uh, genes are and in this case they would have no effect okay